tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We are looking at options. The Premier hints at changes to BC's drug decriminalization project. In the wake of decriminalization, there are many of those locations where we have absolutely no authority. While supporters urge cooperation. Let's get to the table and, and make this work. Plus. We're facing this kind of double-edged crisis. More demand for help, less help to give. BC charities and nonprofits are getting creative to try to help more people. A lot of students, for example, uh, from SFU um, will go just to practice teaching math. And... Oh, my God. After last summer's wildfires destroyed hundreds of homes around the North Shoe Swamp, we return to hear why some people didn't leave and how they're preparing for this season. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Dan Burrard. Thanks for joining us. BC's Premier is hinting at changes to the province's drug decriminalization pilot program, now more than a year old. There are concerns about public safety and enforcement, among other things. This week, police chiefs testified in Ottawa about concerns they had on how officers handle open drug use. Mira Baines has more on what this means for the future of drug decriminalization. As we head towards a provincial election, BC's Premier says changes may be coming to the three-year drug decriminalization pilot project. We are looking at options. The pilot under a Health Canada exemption allows adults to possess a small amount of illicit drugs for personal use. But criticism has been growing over open drug use in public spaces. Simply because we have compassion and concern about those struggling with addiction does not mean that we need to give up our public spaces does not mean that we need to uh, have uh, parks or playgrounds that are less safe. Uh, and I share those concerns. EB's comments come after police forces testified to the House of Commons Health Committee sharing concerns from frontline officers. In the wake of decriminalization, there are many of those locations where we have absolutely no authority to address that problematic drug use because the person appears to be in possession of less than 2.5 grams. The BC government brought in the Public Consumption Act to prevent drug use at bus stops and public entrances, but that was blocked by the courts after a legal challenge. The federal minister of mental health and addictions will be meeting with her BC counterpart next week. The province could end the pilot or ask Ottawa to change it. Some advocates for harm reduction are deeply concerned. Let's get to the table and, and make this work because I, I want to tell you this. The other way is going to drive people into isolation. And so if it's, you know, to alleviate some public consumption in specific areas, then Hey, I'm all for that. The official opposition, BC United, has been highlighting illicit drug use in hospitals and what it says are a lack of safety measures. Because we knew it would result in exactly what's happening now, which is an explosion of, of drug use taking place on sky trains and restaurants and public spaces. Um, it's been a horrific failure. And the thing that's important to recognize is we're not seeing improved results. And while provincial and federal elections inch closer, communities across BC try to balance public drug use, harm reduction, and concerns about public safety. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. Still with policing, there are more questions about it in Surrey. Two leaked federal letters are revealing some conflicting messages. A letter sent by RCMP Commissioner Mike Duhame to Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth last week points out gaps in oversight, saying there were about 180 Surrey police officers in the RCMP detachment without a green light to deliver RCMP services. It questions statements Farnworth has made earlier, earlier this month that the province and Ottawa had agreed to a transition plan that would not require federal legislative changes. Still a second letter from Federal Minister Dominic LeBlanc dated yesterday endorses efforts to date, something Farnworth says reflects the work done since the first letter was sent. We believe that uh, we have that path uh, to be able to proceed forward uh, that would not uh, result in the uh, RCMP having to surrender authority to another uh, policing agency uh, during the transition. The province and the city are set for court April 29th for a legal challenge by the city. It claims a change in the Police Act by the government is unconstitutional because it places limits on voters' freedom of expression. We are closing in on the end of National Volunteer Week, but since the pandemic, charities and nonprofits have seen more demand for help 
and less help to give. As Edzio Lover tells us, some agencies are getting creative to find volunteers. As I do, there's some blankets there. Volunteering your time, skills, and kindness is becoming increasingly difficult in our fast-paced world. We came up with Blanket BC as a, as a passion project, as a father-son team, but uh, whenever there's an opportunity um, to uh, collect or distribute, I do. Um, so it's all volunteer-based, um, and t time is of the essence. Blanket BC Society is a small grassroots nonprofit, handing out blankets to shelters and people who are unhoused. Volunteers can be hard to come by, and they aren't alone. We're facing this kind of double-edged crisis where more people are reliant on those services, and yet fewer people are volunteering their time to support the delivery of those services in community. According to a recent Canada Helps Giving report, a significant amount of Canadians rely on charities for basic needs. Almost half of charities report an increase in demand, and most rely on volunteers to operate. Those kinds of tensions really need to be elevated and we need to think about what's the kind of country we actually want to be building and contributing to. The tensions have inspired some organizations to get creative. Modernizing our approach to volunteer recruitment is getting out in the communities and making sure that we're present for everybody. And making sure the volunteer has incentives. They also want to get something more out of the programs, such as using a skill that they want to practice. We have mentoring with math, for example, where a lot of people who, a lot of students, for example, uh, from SFU um, will go just to practice teaching math. And for this volunteer, it all adds up to happy moments. It's one of the most rewarding things that you can do, just giving without sort of ex like expecting anything in return. But I think the world could always do with a little more kindness. Edzi Ulavrin, CBC News, Vancouver. More than 100 people gathered in Langley to mark the 73rd anniversary of a critical battle in the Korean War. The ceremony honored the Battle of Gap Yong, a significant fight to defend Seoul, where Canadian troops played a large role. The president of the Korean Veterans Association says the average age of the Canadian War veterans is 93. They estimate about 250 of them live in B.C. A golden retriever named Stella has helped make legal history in our province after a woman and her ex-boyfriend were ordered to share custody of the dog. As Tanya Fletcher tells us, the ruling follows a new law that says pets are more than property, they're family. Sahar Bayat is overjoyed to be reunited with her dog Stella after spending the last 10 months in legal limbo. It was a long process. It was very lengthy, very costly. She and her partner got Stella as a puppy in 2020. Last year, they split up. Bayat says her ex kept Stella because only his name was on the dog's certificate. Well, I couldn't bear the pain of not having her. She was a huge part of my life. I, I, we spent 24-7 together. She was so devastated, she wound up getting another dog, Lola, as the legal process unfolded. Their case ultimately became the first of its kind to go before the B.C. Supreme Court. Bayat hired lawyers, paid $60,000 in legal fees, and eventually the judge ordered joint custody. I'm very, very thankful for, for the new law because, you know, these days dogs are just like kids to everyone else. They are my kids and I will fight tooth and nail for them. The landmark decision comes three months after BC updated its Family Law Act, now recognizing pets not as property but as members of the family. Before it was simply whoever owned the pet got to keep the pet. Now the courts will consider eight relational factors under the new legislation. We're seeing how the pet fits into the family setting. Is there a bond with the child? Uh, who really cared for the pet? Who picked up the poop? I mean, it's not as simplistic as, say, the ownership of a bicycle. Victoria Schroff is a lawyer who specializes in animal rights and was consulted by the province in making these changes. She says B.C. is the first to pass such legislation and other provinces have since approached her to help bring in similar laws. I'm really excited with the prospect of B.C. having set up a, a big precedent uh, in legislation for other provinces to follow potentially. Yes. yes. As for Bayat. It was all worth it. It was all worth it. Honestly, I would do it all over again for her. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Surrey, B.C. Quite a sight in Prince George. The city's Walmart is closed. 
after a car smashed into it. Take a look. Mounties say it happened around 2.30 in the morning and left a gaping hole in the concrete wall. The store is closed until further notice as they check all that damage. Police say there were no passengers in the car. The driver was taken to hospital, thankfully with no serious injuries. The Ahatasat First Nation confirms that attempts to rescue that stranded orca calf are now on hold. A large fishing vessel with a built-in crane device had recently been sent to Zabalos to lift the whale out. The female calf has been stranded alone for nearly a month since its pregnant mother died after getting trapped on a beach during low tide. A team of more than 50 people tried to get the calf out last Friday but were not successful. Ahead of the weekend, Darius Madavi is here to tell us how nice it's going to be and if today's a judge, very nicely done. Yes, well, eh, there's a bit of change <laughs> on the way. Uh, it'll still way be a it, very, pal. it'll be a very nice weekend. There's gonna be blue skies tomorrow, a little bit of cloud moves in in the uh, early afternoon, and then some rain to follow later in the afternoon, uh, but still going to be a very pleasant time. Uh, a little bit of rain never hurt most people. Um, now we're going to see those showers continue into early morning Sunday before clearing up again, as you could see there. Uh, so again, some cloud moves in, followed by some rain late tomorrow, and then those showers should be tapering off by early morning Sunday, meaning if you're doing the sun run, or if you just have an outdoor activity you're excited for on Sunday, the rain shouldn't be interfering. If we zoom out to the rest of the province, it's a very similar story. Those showers breaking into parts of the interior, uh, but mostly those showers and flurries coming for the interior uh, overnight Saturday into Sunday, so probably not too much interruption, although a lot of that cloud will be lingering into Sunday as well before probably clearing up Monday. Uh, now, in terms of conditions across the province uh, tonight, we're not going to see too much activity at all once again. Uh, the cloud not moving in even for the west coast of the island until probably late tomorrow morning. So just calm conditions, cool in many places, but um, not expecting anything anything serious at all. Uh, and then if we take a look at our overnight uh, forecast for here in BC, uh, or here in Vancouver, sorry, uh, 15 degrees and sunny tonight, and then mm -hmm. still cool, but very pleasant tomorrow morning. Sounds nice. We'll talk later. Thanks. Thank you. As BC's affordable housing crisis grinds on, many are looking for creative solutions. Some are finding that in Habitat for Humanity Victoria. The agency is pitching 14 new townhomes in Saanich financed with affordable mortgages. That plan is now awaiting approval from the district of Saanich. Scott Duchak is the CEO of Habitat for v Humanity Victoria. Scott, thanks for joining us. First of all, how, My pleasure. how could you explain how this pro housing project is going to work if it goes through? Yeah, so what we're proposing is the largest project in our organization's history of 14 stacked townhouses, uh, 13 of which are three bedroom uh, homes, uh, and then we have one one bedroom fully accessible home. Um, it, and as you mentioned, we just recently submitted our planning documentation. We're a bit, uh, a bit away from putting a shovel in the ground, but it's an exciting project for a few reasons. Number one, it's what people call missing middle, something that's been talked about a lot, but not a lot of people have seen. Uh, it's family size units, as I mentioned, and third, it's focused on affordable home ownership, which allows working families to become homeowners and realize all those benefits. So your listeners might also, viewers might also be interested to know that Habitat for Humanity is the only national nonprofit focused on, uh, you know, finding that middle ground between rental housing and, and ownership. Hmm. Uh, when you say affordable, what are we talking about? How much would it cost somebody? So, you know, we haven't issued our construction contracts yet. Um, but it's going to be significantly below market. And who the people that we help um, are, are employed, they have uh, an ability to pay a mortgage, although they're moderate income. And, you know, they've perhaps been frustrated with the inability to overcome, you know, the, the burden of coming up with a huge down payment to buy a house or carry a mortgage. So uh, that's who we help, uh, but it'll be significantly below market prices. Habitat for Humanity is offering a, a tailor-made mortgage. How do you manage to do that? Right. So it's a really good feature of our organization where uh, we build the houses inexpensively out of the gate because we're a nonprofit. And then we uh, work with partner families to come up with a commercial first mortgage for around 50 to 60 percent of the value of the house. And then we come in with a tailored second mortgage that is interest free and we gear it to uh, ensure that the families spend no more than 30 percent of their household income on shelter costs. So that's how we work with the program. And, uh, you know, uh, it's been very successful for us in the past, and we're looking forward to doing it on this project as well. 
How difficult is it for nonprofits like yours to spearhead these kinds of, of housing projects? How much leeway do you get? Yeah, it's very, very difficult. You know, the biggest challenge that we have is coming up with uh, financing and funding. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk these days about uh, the housing crisis, rightfully so. And there's been uh, a lot of focus on, on purpose-built rental housing. But what we're concerned about is really uh, without meaningful pathways from rental to home ownership, we risk bifurcating Canadian society into a renter class and an ownership class. So we've been trying to work with the province and the feds for financing and uh, trying to tack on to some of those, you know, great uh, ambitious strategies they've used, used for rental housing, like no GST, um, low cost financing, surplus government lands. We think those should also be available to nonprofit home ownership groups like ours. Scott Duchak, CEO of Habitat for Humanity Victoria. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Months after a fire tore through communities in Shoe Swap, there are still questions as the rebuilding continues. We're going back to that region to meet a community still wondering what happened and worrying what's next. Stick around.
Wildfire season is inching closer in B.C. with some small blazes already starting. With more sun, heat and dryness on the way, that is many people worried and trying to prepare, especially after last year's destruction. Our John Hernandez and videographer Mike Zimmer went to the Shoe Swap region, where the relationship between the B.C. Wildfire Service and many people there is still fractured. On the north side of the Shoe Swap Lake. This is where a wildfire tore through 170 homes and businesses last summer. It's also where a group of residents defied evacuation orders, staying behind to fight the fires themselves. At the time, they accused the BC Wildfire Service of mismanaging the fire. We are here to find out if that's something they still believe and hear about any other concerns they might have as a new wildfire season approaches. We saw it the night before, huge like mushroom cloud up above those hills. But there was no controlling that that day. But the North Sea Swap was being ignored. I have lost trust in the BC Wildfire Service. Maybe uh, one or two things that could have been done different. I don't have any hard feelings towards them at all. They did the best they could possibly do. The wildfires in BC's Shoe Swap region started in mid-July, caused by lightning strikes. The human impact minimal until August, when the flames started pushing towards small communities along the lake. Jim Cooperman, a forestry activist in Lee Creek, fled. The fire burned right up to his house. His past efforts to fire smart the property paid off. If those trees had been there, if that forest had been there, mm -hmm. the, the fire would have still had so much velocity, it would have come right through our property mm -hmm. and could have burned all the homes yeah. down below us. Yeah. So you've had this property for quite some time, Mike. Since 1968, mm -hmm. moved mm -hmm. here from the States mm -hmm. as a war resistor in 1969. Uh, okay. And I designed and built yeah. the house. And the year after you fire smarted it, a wildfire hit. That's right. Yeah. And I'm an environmentalist and I've been concerned about wildfires and promoting uh, fire smarting. Mm -hmm. and, and who does the fire hit? Mm -hmm. Us. It's, it, the irony is just so mm -hmm. thick you could cut it with a knife. Yeah. Cooperman's among many local critics of the BC Wildfire Service, specifically in its decision to light a planned ignition on August 17th. And the fire was like a blowtorch coming out of that canyon. Which he believes contributed to the spread of the fire down the mountainside. Then we find out that the Forest Serv Wildfire Service is planning to do a backburn, which is a, was a 10 kilometer long aerial ignition just two kilometers from our house. Mm -hmm. And just prior to a windstorm, we were all totally freaked right out. The planned ignition or backburn was set up along this stretch of power lines. The goal was to proactively burn up a swath of dry forest to stop the wildfire from spreading past it. The power lines would serve as a fire control line. I want to be perfectly clear, that planned ignition saved hundreds of homes and properties along the North Shushua. Unfortunately, with the wind that we knew was forecast and that was coming, that fire went above uh, the control line that we burned off from and then swept back into the communities in the North Shushua. Retired Kamloops forester Bruce Morrow agrees to take us up to see the back burn. Scorched forest lines the old logging road leading up to it. It means we're losing wildlife habitat, we're losing water values, we're losing visuals, we're losing the creation, and we're losing our, our forest industry. Logging machinery renders the site inaccessible by vehicle, but our drone gets a bird's eye view of the planned ignition site, showing swaths of burnt trees on both sides of the wildfire services control line. Yeah, the plant ignition is probably um, something to do with wh why this area burnt. Well, as you can see, there's no leaves left on these trees. So this, this is a crown fire through here, and this would have come through here in minutes. Satellite images show just how far the fire burned beyond the control line after the winds picked up. 
Those on the ground had little time to act. This is the house here. That's where the um, wood heater was. That was the landing for our porch was right here. This was a log house. Mm -hmm. um, we built, built it uh, 48 years ago, uh, from the, pretty much from the sticks and stones that are in the front yard, so to speak. Rod Poffenbarger and Alana Stearns fled their home. All of a sudden, we got a knock on the door from a neighbor, not any alerts on our phone, no. to say, get out, the fire's here. So we just scrambled It was out. an hour and a half or two hours later that we got It was about two hours that. later before we got the actual alert on our phone. Walk out on the back porch, and it sounded like a jet airplane coming down the canyon here. Yeah. It just, it was frightening to make your hair stand on end. And uh, that picked up the pace considerably. Mm -hmm. The fire moving faster than evacuation orders could be issued. While Rod and Alana left, many others stayed behind, trying to protect their property. Provincial officials told them to leave. If you are under an evacuation order, you must leave immediately. This isn't a suggestion, it is the law. You're making a highly dangerous situation even more dangerous for everyone involved. Alana Stearns, among many who were frustrated by the province's messaging. They're getting arrested. People in Inglemont running out of food. They're trying to help boat stuff over. Like, where's the logic in that? I, People safe is number one, right? I just felt that the North Shoe Shop was being ignored at the time. All the uh, yeah. media attention was Kelowna, Kelowna, yeah. Kelowna. Those who did stay behind confronted with a rapidly moving inferno. This marina among the front lines where residents battled flames overnight. So this is, you know, one of our water trucks that we have rigged. It's obviously just a dump truck with, you know, a tank and a pump. And, you know, if this thing could talk, boy, it, it, uh, it saved so much of this area. It's just incredible. You know. Marina manager Mark Acton says he sprung into action well before evacuation orders went out. What do you make of the messaging that the province, BC Wildfire Service, put out at the time, telling people to get out, you're putting people's lives at risk, obey evacuation orders? A lot of people do need to leave, but anybody that's actually, you know, able and, and willing to help, that uh, they have the assets and the equipment, mm -hmm. uh, and they know this area, the locals know the area. Nobody knows the bush in their backyard better than the locals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if the locals did not stay, this whole town would be in a lot worse shape. All right. Acton takes us on a tour of the area where his locals got to work. Myself and my two neighbors, both my age, we both gave up on our houses because it was coming so fast. Wow. And we just stuck to the marina. Uh, but then uh, we were up this way and uh, we managed to, you know, keep the fire in the ditch line here, stopped it right here. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a loader in my neighbor's yard and put the fire out at his woodshed, his fence line uh, and that tree. Residents scrambled to keep the fire from spreading to the nearby Shuswap Lake Provincial Park. If this park was gone, there'd be, for most people, no reason to come here. I have lost trust in the BC Wildfire Service. Um, yeah, it was just very, very poorly planned. BC's Forest Practices Board is investigating the planned ignition after complaints were lodged by Shuswap residents. The Forestry Ministry says the Wildfire Service welcomes the review. Meanwhile, Acton and his neighbours say they're even more prepared if another fire comes along. But further east, where most of the forests remain intact, residents fear the risk of a future burn is even higher. When it came over the top here, Frank Riley's barns had already burnt mm -hmm. from a hot amber. And I was on the D7 cat of Frank's and just putting a guard around his hay fields and stuff. And I looked up and Martin Lucas lives just on our neighbor here. I said, Martin, it's crafted these. I don't want to look up. And within minutes, it started coming down. And when I put that D7 cat in idle, mm -hmm. you could hear the roar of that fire, mm -hmm. literally. Yeah. Local lumberjack Carl Bischoff fought the fire on its easternmost flank. We had about uh, probably 30 to 40 guys here on both sides with about a dozen pickups and the big water trucks and whatever. 
and we chased it for nine days before the red coat mm -hmm. showed up. Mm -hmm. I mean, where are they? Red coats meaning BC Wildfire yeah. Service workers. And it's nothing personal. <laughs> yeah. I was calling red coats. It's all good. But if they have, the part we find disturbing is they don't have enough soldiers to fight the war. Mm -hmm. So just call upon us. It's so simple. And we have lots of knowledge. <laughs> Bischoff is putting together what could be called a citizen fire brigade, composed of registered tree fallers and residents who have taken BC's basic fire suppression course. We're just going to be a little small little fire brigade. We see smoke, no strings attached, we're going to go after it mm -hmm. until forestry shows up. And if we're told to go home, we'll go home. But they're going to maintain it mm -hmm. and they're going to put it out. And what we're going to do here is use this as our fire trailer. And ne next week we've got about another four to five thousand dollars worth of hoses and pumps coming. But it's just the basics. We had to do something so that we're, we're ready. The regional district's elected director for the North Shoe Swamp supports Bischoff's plans and residents getting trained. He says it will allow them to legally stay behind in the event of future evacuation orders, as long as they work with wildfire service. BC wildfires will take them and put them mm -hmm. where they're needed with the regular BC wildfire crews. Um, those people who don't actually sign up and work with BC wildfires will be under the same evacuation mm -hmm. orders as everybody that isn't trained. Mm -hmm. And they may or may not go with that evacuation order. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a while for that trust to come back. We need to have better communication with BC wildfires and certainly communication I think is the biggest challenge that we had last year. Changes that could be on the way soon. In response to the fires, an expert task force made a series of recommendations to the province, including pathways for local community involvement during wildfires. The goal is to build better communication, cooperation and trust the Premier has pledged to follow through with them. It's an emergency. We don't want to be dealing with conflict on the ground. We want to be working together as a unified whole. So this was one of the uh, specific areas that uh, I asked the task force to, to look at. Uh, how do we better integrate local knowledge? How do we better integrate local people into our fire response? Also included in the recommendations is to enhance post-wildfire supports, a service some victims say is desperately needed here as many still struggle to rebuild. Um, this was our house. It's hard to put into words, but everything we had is now gone. Mm -hmm. And at our age, you know, it's going to be pretty much impossible to rebuild. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just try and move forward mm -hmm. if we can. Yeah. You know, uh, it's been seven, eight months now, we're still homeless. Uh, we have a roof over our head, but it's not our home. Um, it's just that, that overwhelming feeling of loss. CBC's cameras captured the aftermath of the fire at Richard Gibbons' property. He lost his home, camper, boat, vehicles, and countless personal belongings. None of it was insured. We've tried every avenue we can to try and, I guess, secure some kind of a recovery fund if it's available. Unfortunately, nothing is available for us because we were renters and we were uninsured. Mm -hmm. um, basically, that falls back onto us for yeah. being uninsured. Despite his momentous loss, he says he's not pointing the finger. I feel that the uh, fire service did everything that they possibly could. You know, they they put their life on the line to save ours. Mm -hmm. I don't have any hard feelings towards them at all. They did the best they could possibly do. Um, weather, that was a huge factor in, in how the fire turned and how it swept through here. They can't control weather. I, I give them kudos. There is a lot of pointing fingers and everything. Uh, you know, there's maybe um, one or two things that could have been done different, but there was no controlling that that day. Squilax First Nation Chief James Toma also doesn't place any blame. 
even at my level, people, well, why didn't you do something about it? And I said, if I had the ability to stand in front of that fire until it stopped, you know, I would have, but no. The day of the fire, Toma was stranded beneath a bridge with his brothers after trying to save their homes. We looked at each other and said, this might be it, eh? We said, I love you and everything and that. Uh, we ended up uh, being trapped under the Little River Bridge and some very brave boys from Adams Lake launched a boat and said, we're coming to get you. 34 houses burned down here. Toma has pledged to rebuild all of them a project that's already well underway. That goes to show if uh, properly done with the right people in place, you can achieve this in a short time because sadly there's communities out there that suffered a, a wildfire loss that uh, still haven't recovered. Opinions as to whether the wildfire could have been avoided are split, but one thing is certain, the damage is done. Communities like this show that rebuilding is possible with the right leadership and supports, but also serve as a reminder of what's at stake as BC faces more hot and dry summers in the future. Almost one billion people are registered to vote in India's general election, and that comes with a mountain of logistical challenges. We'll show you them next.
India's national election began today, a marathon, six-week vote with almost one billion eligible voters. Today's balloting was the first phase and the largest. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seeking a third term and his Hindu Nationalist Party is expected to win. He currently presides over robust economic growth, but critics accuse his government of discriminating against the Muslim minority and targeting opponents with criminal prosecution. There are also economic grievances. Farmers demand higher prices for crops and urban youth unemployment is at 16 percent. Six more voting phases are scheduled and the final one is on June 1st. Our South Asia correspondent Salima Shivji shows the enormous challenges involved in getting nearly a billion people to the polls. <laughs> A weekday evening at a busy market in India's capital. And while the focus here is on finding good deals on shirts and shoes, not on casting a ballot, it still gives you a sense of just how many people live here and what it takes to pull off the complicated logistics of the world's biggest election. It's certainly that. There are nearly a billion eligible voters here in India, 968 million to be precise. And getting them to the polls is a mammoth task. Indian election is not only the biggest election in the world, it is the biggest management event of any kind in the world. The logistics are uh, mind-boggling. He would know. That's S.Y. Qureshi, a former head of India's election commission. And he wants to focus on that number, almost a billion voters. That's more than the populations of the U.S., the European Union and Russia combined. India's election officials go door to door in the years between votes to update the country's electoral roll. So reaching out to one billion people, it can't get any bigger. The only thing which can big, uh, get bigger is our own election next time. Uh, five years later, it will be even bigger. So that, that's what it is. At least one million polling stations. And 15 million polling agents, many of whom go to extreme lengths to reach every Indian voter, taking boats, choppers, even horses, trekking through mountains deep in the Himalayas and through lion-infested jungles. Sometimes a team travels 70 kilometers to set up a booth for just one person. Meet the Indian man who gets his very own voting booth. A priest and a dedicated voter with a polling station all to himself for years. Because India's election commission guarantees you can vote within two kilometers of your home. Unfortunately, this guy died last year. <laughs> so we are one uh, polling station less now. <laughs> but the idea is to show that how every vote, uh, every single vote matters. Security also matters, and that's why India's election happens in phases. Seven days of voting spread out over more than six weeks in 543 ridings crisscrossing the entire country. That's so tens of thousands of federal paramilitary troops who are freed up to keep the election safe can travel across a country so big in order to make sure no violence breaks out. As for the politics of it all, there's deep support in many quarters for Narendra Modi, prime minister for the last decade, gunning for a third straight term. His power well entrenched and his popularity unparalleled. I trust Modi, I, I vote Modi. We need Modi because uh, to change our India, like to develop our India, Modi's needed. Why do you compare him to because a god? same qualities he is having. He is selfless, selfless. He works only for the people. But there's also concern about an increasingly less democratic India and that this election is one-sided, especially when it comes to money. Political donations, mostly from large corporations, were unlimited and anonymous ever since Modi's party, the BJP, set up a new system in 2017. But India's Supreme Court recently struck down that arrangement, calling it unconstitutional. Turns out Modi's party received billions of dollars of untraceable money from the scheme, says longtime political scientist Rajiv Vargava. Uh, there is no level playing field at the moment, and the BJP is actually getting uh, uh, about 10 times more than the next, you know, uh, political party. But there is another worry that has crept in, which is uh, the undermining of institutions. 
The media, the judiciary, it's a slide towards a more autocratic India, he says, in a country fiercely proud of its title as the world's largest democracy, where voter turnout is usually very high. A massive democratic process that has no parallel, with weeks of voting, but all of those millions of votes counted and released all in one day, June 4th. The weather is warming up and animals are spring cleaning, getting ready for little ones. After the break, why you might be hearing woodpeckers going head to head with tree trunks or even cement pillars. You'll want to see this. Hey, I'm Rohit Joseph. Vibin is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. Stream Vibin on CBC Listen. Doris Madevi is back with the BC wide weather forecast uh, in John and Mike's stunning and rather epic piece. We saw the damage that wildfires have caused across our province. You have an update on what's going on. 
Yes, uh, we've been tracking the fire danger since the update started coming out again uh, roughly uh, a month ago now, half a month, started out at the beginning of April. Uh, this is probably the highest we've seen the fire danger since they started coming out again this year. Uh, lots of moderate, even pockets of high fire danger throughout the central and northern parts of the province. Now, this weekend, we're going to see temperatures moderate in some places, but not up north where the fire danger is high. They're going to stay uh, quite high. We've got nothing but sun for the northern half of the province, uh, and so we're going to expect really not much change in this for many places. Some showers will break into parts of the southern interior, but generally speaking, uh, it won't be enough to budge uh, much of anything, really. Just some very light showers, as you can see here, some very sporadic stuff. Uh, some flurries at those higher elevations, maybe doing a little bit for snowpack, adding uh, a few centimeters, but uh, probably not even that, honestly, for most places. So uh, overall, not much change coming this weekend in terms of the fire danger. Maybe a bit of a change for at least how people, what, what it feels like for people on the south coast, Vancouver Island, because We'll get some showers uh, for parts of the interior, though those are all going to be coming overnight, so probably not going to notice it all that much. Uh, although be aware, uh, for the south coast, Vancouver Island, uh, here in Vancouver, we're going to be seeing uh, some fairly high winds tomorrow uh, at times, especially late in the day. Uh, easterly winds, so it might feel a little bit cool, be a little bit breezy. Uh, now, in terms of temperatures, though, those aren't changing very much over the next few days, coming down a degree or two uh, on the coast, a little bit more inland, you can see there, uh, particularly on Sunday, because that system isn't rolling in until late Saturday. Saturday will have already hit our high before temperatures start coming down, so expect maybe a little bit of a drop in those evening hours. Uh, conditions tomorrow, relatively calm, nothing but sunshine. Again, in the north, a little bit of cloud. This is probably overstating how much cloud we're going to get on the coast there. Uh, and then fairly calm throughout the southern interior as well. Just that rain coming uh, probably late in the day for most places uh, on the coast. Now you can see here how much rain we're going to get. Uh, probably, again, not too much. It looks like a, a lot of flashing lights. It looks like it's a lot of excitement, but really uh, just some scattered showers that should taper off by early uh, Sunday morning. So don't expect to see too much into there as well. So anybody doing the sun run, for instance, not mm -hmm. have to worry too much about getting poured on. Uh, and generally speaking, after those showers, we're sunny again on Monday, and then some more showers come mid next week. So some change okay. on the way. Something That's different. all right. Showers are all right. Yeah. And it's Friday, so that means... Fun fact Friday. Flowers are blooming, bees are buzzing, and the birds are breaking stuff. Darius, take a look at this. Everybody, please. <laughs> Working on the concrete. <laughs> What is going on here? Yes, yeah, so that was taken right outside the CBC building. Uh, I, I saw that actually. So uh, this behavior, more than likely what he's doing, he's not confused probably. He doesn't think that's Let's a hope tree. Uh, now, uh, these these are, uh, this is a northern flicker. They are cavity nesters. So you might mm -hmm. think, oh, he's confused it for a tree. He's trying to make himself a home. Uh, that's not the case here. Instead, uh, really all he's doing is uh, trying to uh, attract some attention more than likely. This behavior is called drumming. They use it to attract mates or even try and defend their territory try and scare off uh, any potential interlopers. So uh, it's, a, it's a fairly common behavior among uh, flickers. Uh, you can see them often uh, drumming on metal signs, really anything that just makes a lot of noise because they want to get they want to get attention. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, northern flickers are very cool. They are a type of woodpecker, which is why they can make that fantastic, uh, very satisfying noise. Uh, but they mostly, uh, their favorite food is ants, unlike most woodpeckers. So they're often found on the ground, unlike, unlike most. They can even be found almost sort of bathing in ants at times. So when they're, oh uh, they're eating, they just uh, they help them clean themselves off. And mm. uh, one more interesting thing about northern flickers, mm -hmm. uh, they were once thought to be two separate species because some of them have this black marking here, some uh -huh. of them have a red marking. Uh, it's thought that they were separated for a while by the glaciers. As the glaciers retreated, mm -hmm. they were found. But they can interbreed, so they're just one species. Okay. And so there you go, northern you flicker. Nice side mustaches. That's yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. Sideburns. Beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. Dust off your boots, put on that 10-gallon Stetson. A new music fest saddles up this weekend. More on the excitement at BC Place after this.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On May 9th, join CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett at the Surrey Board of Trade's Top 25 Under 25 Awards, celebrating the incredible initiatives of Surrey's youth. And CBC Vancouver is the exclusive media partner of the DOXA Documentary Film Festival, May 2nd to 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, and industry events. For festival information, visit doxafestival.ca. This ain't Texas, you know that, but it seems country music is having a bit of a moment here in B.C. The first Coast City Country Music Festival with headliners like Luke Bryan and Dirk Bentley is in town tonight and Saturday at B.C. Place in the Commodore Ballroom. We hit the streets to ask folks and cowpokes how they feel about country. Country music has like a narrative. It tells a story. I think it's real music. Live bands, real musicians, it's not techno, it's not computers, so it's real music, but not my kind of music. That twang, it's got that twang in it. A hoot and holler in time, I don't know. <laughs> I, I would have to agree. Is this a Beyonce thing? Well, we're big fans of Morgan Wallen. Morgan Wallen, yeah. Well, obviously, most recently, Beyonce. <laughs> I do like D Dixie Chicks. Carrie Underwood is that banger. From before, I would say like Lady A, maybe like the Chicks. Hey, if Beyonce is leading, leading the charge, then we're all for it. Favorite country artist? Dolly Parton. Okay. Kenny That's Rogers. It. Wow, nice. going with the classics. Yeah. There we are. Nicely done. A Surrey-based pastry chef made it to the finals on season three of the Netflix series, Is It Cake? Contestants were tasked with baking cakes that resemble real-life objects. Jujar Mann joined Amy Bell on the early edition today to talk about the hard work required to make food art. Have a look. Eight hours for making hyper-realistic cakes is not enough. No. On average, you need like two <laughs> to three days because it's literal food art that it we're is. all creating. It is. You are all artists. And, you know, throughout the show, you made you made a lot of cakes. Um, so one um, resembled a burlap bag of flour. I don't just say it resembled. It is yeah. a burlap f bag of flour. So I want to know the process of how you go about building these cakes. Like... These cakes, like I said, they're a work of art. There's, they're also engineering required. Yeah. You know, like when I was making the burlap bag, you know, the bag was heavy on top and skinnier on the bottom. There's so much that's involved um, in terms of like structure. You know, it has to last a long time. Like there's just so much going on with these cakes and just so much like you got to have that sharp eye for detail because yeah. you got to fool the judges. And it was just, just amazing. And you see that pizza that yeah. was there? That was the cake. I'm so sad I didn't come in early today. I want I pizza cake. Early. It was delicious. Chocolate pizza cake. People are taking photos of it. Oh, yeah. It'll be on the gram in no time. I'm Delic hungry, but I don't know if it's for pizza or for cake. Find out. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. Watch our newscast on CBC Gem, the free app, as well as on YouTube and our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Sarah Premji will have your next local newscast at 11 o'clock right after the National. Have a good night.